Benchmark, the voice of business, presented by LMD. On this edition of Benchmark, to discuss the transport and logistics sector, we are joined in the studio by the Managing Director of Hemawas Transportation Sector, Kasturi Chelaraja Wilson. Then, Nielsen's Managing Director, Shaheen Carter, expands on the reasons for the BCI's virtual standstill. And LMD columnist, Dashal Dimel, has the last word with his insights on Sri Lanka's macro outlook. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Hello and welcome to Benchmark. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. Today in our studios is Kasturi Chalaraja Wilson, the Managing Director of the Transportation Sector of Hema's Holdings and she's going to shed some insight onto Sri Lanka's transport and logistics sector. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Kasturi. Thank you for inviting me, Savitri, and pleasure is mine. Now, if you view the transport and logistics sector in our country at this point of time, what are you seeing? Well, in our country, um, this industry is not the most evolved industry, but uh, one thing I've seen for the last couple of years is that we are trying to drive the per capita income as well as of the, with the recent changes, you see that uh, they're kind of giving relief to the masses where their disposable income would uh, increase. So with that rise domestic com consumption, so with the rise in domestic consumption, the local producers and the, they become more competitive. They have to become competitive because the consumer is more demanding and more discerning. And you've, I have seen for the last one year from the type of requests and demands coming onto the logistics side uh, that the local companies, in order to be more competitive and to come up with you know, new products based on the, uh, the consumer's change requirements, they need to focus on their core. So they get into their R&D, they get into product development, manufacturing, and the supply chain, logistics, distribution, uh, the integrated solutions of all that is outsourced. So there is a shift of the logistics industry needing to equip itself to cater to the change in the domestic market. Um, that would mean upskilling ourselves, getting technology input, which we have not been doing vis-a-vis -vis if you look at uh, Singapore or the, or the European countries, which we are not to that level. So I think on the positive side, it's just, I, it would be growth in the future, uh, purely because the domestic market seems to be also in the correct tra trajectory. You know, we've always been talking about how strategically located we are. We are in the intersection of the Eastern and Western shipping lines. Uh, we are also close to the Indian market. Have we as a country actually capitalized, maximized the potential that we have uh, in the logistics sector? I, I just, I don't know, I just read it and I know for a fact we are lucky that we are in this location. Um, we are right in the intersection, so uh, as you say, between the East and the West. Uh, the trade between the East and the West is not, to go, not going anywhere. It would still remain. But to become a hub, you have to have certain elements. You need to have your infrastructure, you need to have your regulatory framework, Instra infrastructure in terms of air, sea, connectivity. You need resources, you need uh, the whole encompass thing to get people to come in and move out. Um, it's a marketing tool. Now we actually are endowed with the location and we are lucky enough for the last couple of years we have invested in the maritime side. On the air side we have not invested too much in the Katunaika airport whereby you have not increased the maybe the runways to increase, increase capacity but on the sea side yes but having said that that is not enough nobody is just going to jump in here and say you are you are the hub we need to market it so for your question we are not doing enough we are not promoting ourselves we are not op making maximum use of it hence having this and doing the hard part of it. Now it is just trying to figure out how do you create a hub here? What do you need to get right? The softer side, the policies, uh, the promotion of it, who do you need to attract? Uh, so having 
all this, we still are not doing enough to get people coming. In the World Bank's ease of doing business rankings, Sri Lanka went up uh, by five, uh, six points to mm. 99. Uh, in reality, Kasturi, since you are in the throes of doing business literally on the ground, uh, what is the reality like for Sri Lanka when it comes to ease of doing business? Well, I try to be positive for Sri Lanka mainly because I try to attract people to come in here. Compared to India and other Asian countries, it's relatively easy. Uh, in terms of the, okay, the issue is when you, the issue is when you want to set up a business, you really don't know. There's no one-stop shop which tells you how in which act or does it come under the BOI, does it come under the Inland Revenue Act? How do you capitalize and set it up? So those things are it lacks. So that means it, it's lef left to the private sector to kind of give the information to the investor to come in. Uh, but I still think we need to encourage people to come in. I think we need a whole load of getting this um, the state institutions which regulate investment to come in and make sure that it's simplified. Uh, they've been talking about a one-stop shop. It, does, it doesn't work. So it is a private sector who gets involved, tries to get interviews. The plus side is you can, they're open. They've been talking about FDI. They want to encourage investment. So if you get an appointment and you take a part in, you can get stuff done in the correct way. But that shouldn't be the process. It should be that there has to be a place where somebody, anybody who wants to invest, comes in, gets the information. It's kind of formalized as long as the pro correct process is uh, adhered to. Um, so if you look at that index, um, the places we have to improve are very easy things to fix, but we are not doing it. So compared to global context, we are really bad. But um, compared to some of the Asian countries, we are better in reality. Previous interview, um, I recall you noted that the government agencies like the BUI, the Port Authority, um, the Inland Revenue Department, all these people must work together if we are going to actually uh, do something, develop and improve on the Colombo port and the, the related industry. Do you believe there is greater room for public-private sector uh, partnerships and, and also what does that entail? In, gen in, uh, in a perfect world, that's the way it should work. But I think we first have to figure out for our country what are the key institutions which should have to be nationalized in the interest of the country and the people. Beyond that, they should have the rest of them having their blueprint as to where they want to go. And when it becomes productivity come becomes an issue, when it uh, means competitiveness, I think the private sector could add value. I purely can say case in point when you see the port, when they op opened it out for SAGT and CIC to come in, uh, be, forget the inf infrastructure, the operating methods and the productivity they brought in, they pushed the benchmark up. So now you find even JCT upping their game and they are, they are compelled to push up. So it would, there is merit, but how they get it sorted out and they should, they should understand maybe it's a landlord operate a kind of a model, but figure out what are the sec sectors where the private sector can bring in competitiveness and efficiencies. And uh, so if you, as I said earlier, it will be an ideal word, yes, but in another five, four to five years, if you are going on the correct roadmap. So we'll get back to this discussion after a break. We pause for some messages now from our sponsors as we get back to Kasturi on the other side. We talk to her about the global trends for the transport and logistics sector and also the thoughts on the representation of females in this industry. Stay with us. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. 
इंट्रोड्यूसिंग पीपल्स लीसिंग एंड फाइनेंस पीएलसी smart devices for total convenience welcome to hnb new world banking thank you for staying with us on benchmark we now continue our discussion with the managing director of the transportation sector of hemas holdings kasturi chelaraja wilson kasturi in your opinion what would be the pragmatic path that companies or entities sri lankan organizations who want to be involved in the maritime sector what kind of path should they take the the companies which are involved in maritime currently are generally in the agency business or a jv with a main liner uh, we are in the maritime um, services field where we operate services to the vessels which come in as well as there is a crew business where they actually train seafarers and supply to the global market um for the maritime business the key element for it to grow would be that um they need to attract more volumes into sri lanka and create this hub so from the local businesses point of view i think for our sustainability su- sustainability we should most probably we need to get together uh we should have one voice as in how do you create this as a hub encourage the um the Mar- maritime authority i use the word authority because i use three terminals as one authority uh, there is a landlord and three separate terminals they have to evolve into operating as the port of colombo so that terminals work together they might have their agreements with different lines that's how singapore or hong kong works and they encourage ships which alternatively go somewhere else to come in here and they work together to create this and for them it's also win win their assets keep getting used so we as local com- companies should encourage them to work together whereas typically this discu- working isolated with three terminals we should encourage them to work together that's the only way that maritime as an industry here would flourish for us what are the global trends we are seeing in the local transport and uh, logistic uh, w- that local transport and logistics entities need to be aware of when you're looking at global trends um one thing i i feel is uh, locally i see a huge change in the domestic market where i was saying that we need to evolve to managing the business or supply chain of the local co- uh, pro- pro- producers so for that it is not what we've been looking at is what we've been doing is we give warehouse space we just stock the overflow we distribute it if you look at absolute 3pl and 4pl which the globe world has evolved to it is about deep diving into the supply chain it's about kpi driven supply chain and logistics where you tell them look you're wasting so much here i will save that for you so we need to figure out as a as a local industry where we can get this knowledge we don't have it because we have not worked in that manner and we need to get it on fast track we'll need to absorb it from some country and the trends they are using technology using data to analyze where you can save money coming up with solutions where you could give back to the consumer it's not only about you making money as a logistics company you become a specialist where you save and give back to the producer where the consumer benefits so it's about an economic benefit for all so those are the trends which we have to absorb it has been i think one year ago we, you could see signs of it being required in sri lanka so from a glo- from a local perspective those are the trends we need to to uh, look at because globally they have moved from 3pl to 4pl so now what i'm saying is sri lanka has to move into proper 3pl as opposed to just warehouses and then you distribute it that's what we call 3pl but that's not what the world calls 3pl you know we are a country that prides ourselves on having uh, on female equality 
uh, sadly, when you look at individual industries and sectors, it doesn't happen in, in your industry specifically. It's a woeful 12% representation. Um, I'm, it would be remiss of me to say, but I do believe that is rather dismal, the 12% representation. Yeah, yeah. What do we need to do to create more awareness and more career opportunities uh, to get more females into this sector? So when I moved into this sector four years ago, I was also very skeptical about how do I adjust because it lacked female representation. But I must be fair, uh, the, the male, the senior teams of you know, representing the maritime and logistics side, they, um, they actually welcomes, welcome you as an uh, equal person. Uh, the lack of female presence in the industry is purely because I think the perception that it's a male dominant industry. It's more the way the industry was before, uh, which is co maritime and co logistics, which is a physical, very um, outdoorsy kind of thing, which aviation had women, which was not attractive. I don't think women found it attractive. But having said that, I see in the maritime and logistics in the middle management level, there are loads of women. There are managers who are very good. Why they don't come up is, I'm not sure how why they don't come up, whether they don't want it or whether there's a lack of opportunity. But you should understand the industries also is, gov the there are majority of it which are entrepreneurs who are sole businessmen. So whether they have opportunity to come up the ranks when it's a family owned, that is a question. Um, but the, on the positive side, with the growth and change in the logistics landscape, especially in 3PL and solution, it's absolutely there's opportunity for women to go. And I see likes of Unilever who have supply chain headed by women. Um, there'll be, I think Nestle has, but they, there is an opportunity for women to play a part and they are taking it. So no longer is the industry a very kind of old boys network and the work doesn't entail getting onto ships and getting onto trucks anymore. It's most, there are sophisticated roles because it is evolved and there has to be a lot of thinking, there's a lot of solutions, there's a lot of innovations required. So I think now it would be a time where women find it attractive. Thank you, Kasturi. A pleasure as always chatting Thank with you. you. Thank you. We've been speaking with Kasturi Chalaraja Wilson, the Managing Director of Hema's Holdings, a transportation sector. On the other side, we have Anushan Selvaraj, and he will be bringing you more on the economy, the market, and other related areas. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. We can show you a world Shining, shimmering, splendid Amazing, beautiful, dazzling, wondrous place for you and me A whole new world The most advanced technology, now on multiple smart devices for total convenience. Welcome to h &B New World Banking. Hello and welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anushan Selvaraja. We're going to take a close look now at the latest on the Business Confidence Index with the Managing Director of Nielsen, Shaheen Kader. Right now, Shaheen, the BCI is at a standstill. Now, what has caused this stalemate and also there is it tends to be a few conflicting uh, views when it comes to the economy. Could you elaborate on what the respondents sure, have sure. said? Yeah, the BCI has remained still for the last couple of months. 
uh, and you know while the majority of, of, of respondents in the business sector are optimistic of the future and their businesses have done well in the past, um, there is a significant minority who are concerned about the future, mainly due to the you know, political instability as a result of the impending elections. So we'll have to write that one out, I guess. So where do they stand in terms of uh, business and investment prospects? Yes, Anushan, that's a very interesting question. You know, I was talking about the 70% who are optimistic about their future business uh, improving. Uh, but, you know, only 34%, almost half that number, are, are optimistic about the investment climate. You know, it is that 34% is almost half the number who felt the investment climate was good in January. So it's almost it's a massive drop. And clearly, you know, this again is due to the political uncertainty and which is weighing heavily on the minds of the business sector. What do respondents have to say are the main factors inhibiting the growth in the business sector? So in addition to political the climate that I talked about, the key other inhibitor is the basic, still remains the basic high cost of goods, you know, as brought, brought about by the high taxes that we, that we pay. Thank you for joining us, Shaheen. That was the Managing Director of Nielsen, Shaheen Kader. After a short commercial break, we will be back with the latest on the economy. Stay tuned. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. We can show you a world Shining, shimmering, splendid Amazing, beautiful, dazzling, wondrous place for you and me A whole new world The future's got a whole new world for you The most advanced technology now on multiple smart devices for total convenience Welcome to h and New World Banking Welcome back to the show. I'm Anushin Selvaraja. Now for a closer look at our economy and joining me is economist and LMD columnist Deshal T. Mel. Now, uh, Deshal, how will our economy fare in the future going forward? Uh, we've just finished five months in the year and so far things have gone pretty much according to expectation. We knew that with uh, the change in government in the early part of the year that there would be some uncertainty, but at the same time we'd ex we expected consumption to be doing quite well in the early part of the year carrying on momentum from the latter part of last year. And that has pretty much moved in line with expectations. Uh, going forward, I'd expect investment to be quite uh, moderate, uh, particularly until we see come some uh, further de a greater degree of stability in terms of policy direction and uh, longer term expectations being anchored. And we, don't, we won't see that until the elections take place. And even after the elections, it remains to be seen whether you will have that kind of policy, uh, that kind of stability going, for, going into the future. Consumption might lose some of its momentum in the next six months. Uh, it will still, it won't, uh, it won't dip in a big way, but I think it might, um, it, we may not see the same level of growth that we saw in the last, say, 12 months or so. Uh, again, that is expected going, um, given, the, uh, given the fact that we're just coming out of a, 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 a low point in consumption and then recovering from that. So in a cyclical, cyclical manner, I'd expect uh, maybe consumption to moderate as well to the second, to the latter part of this year as well. On the external side, uh, first quarter results uh, we've seen um, fairly uh, fairly stagnation, a fair amount of stagnation in export growth. Uh, import growth has also been uh, quite low, helped by lower oil prices. Uh, and I think a similar kind of trend we could expect in the latter part of the year as well, continuing difficulty in uh, growing export markets and imports should also be relatively subdued due to moderation in, uh, in oil prices as well. 
Now, our unemployment rate is on the decline, but so is uh, the rate of our labor force participation. Now, uh, what are the reasons behind this trend? Well, it's a definitional thing initially because unemployment refers to those who are looking for work but cannot find a job. Whereas you can be uh, in the you can be not working but in the uh, but not in the labor force if you're not working but not looking for a job as well. So those are the, that's the difference between the two. Um, so the unemployment rate is quite low. It's at uh, um, probably about 4.4 percent uh, right now, which is which is quite good. The more worrying thing is that, uh, as you said, labor force participation is down to about 53 percent, which is lower than what it was in the previous uh, in the previous quarter, and that is uh, a matter of concern because if you look at Sri Lanka's uh, economic uh, trajectory, one of the constraints that you have is in terms of access to labor, access to skilled labor in particular. And if you have only 53 percent of the labor force actually participating in the employment process, then you already have a, a fairly tight situation that makes it difficult for companies to expand and uh, to, to go into new ventures and so on. So that's, that's, that's a big bottleneck for, economic, uh, for the economic outlook as well. There are many factors that have gone into this. One of the most interesting ones that I think came out quite starkly in the most recent labor force survey was that if you if you disaggregate the labor force participation, you can see that among males it's about 75 percent, but among females it's about 35 percent. So there is a there is a big gap there. And I think uh, if you also look at, for example, university enrollments, about 65 percent of those with uh, who are coming out of universities are females. Uh, and therefore, what you can see is that maybe the investment that is going into education is not necessarily translating into outcomes in the labor force. So clearly, there is a lot of mismatches in the labor in the labor market, educational markets, and so on that need to be looked at. Um, in terms of la female labor force participation, several things need to be considered. I mean. One is the issue of greater flexibility in things like working hours, ability to work from remote places, uh, things like maternity leave. The fact that uh, the companies have to bear the cost of the maternity leave is one, is, uh, is one factor that uh, makes them reluctant to hire women of, say, uh, uh, childbearing age and so on. And in some countries, you see that maternity leave, the cost of maternity leave is subsidized to an extent, and that is something that we could uh, consider as well. Of course, the other point of view is that almost uh, half of those who the women who are out of the labor force the reason given is the fact that they need to engage in domestic uh, domestic work and in many countries which I think is pr probably something we need to look at that is not considered to be a, a legitimate economic activity whereas in actual fact that probably is something uh, that is a, a legitimate economic activity so maybe it's a way that we look at our how we define uh, employment as well but clearly these are some of the factors that are really uh, holding back labor force participation and that is really leading to a big constraint to economic growth going forward. Thank you for joining us, Deshal. That was Economist and LMD columnist Deshal Timel. Thank you for watching Benchmark and we hope to see you again next time.